This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. My name is Fred Carver and I'm the campaign director for a very small NGO called the Sri Lanka Campaign for Peace and Justice. And we are a multi-ethnic and international NGO which is looking for a lasting peace in Sri Lanka, but believes a lasting peace in Sri Lanka needs to be built on a strong foundation of capitalism and human rights. Um, and I'm joined by Yolanda Foster from Amnesty International, who's the Sri Lankan Desk Officer, and will be joined by Dr. Rajesh Vidigopal from the LSC. Um, and the question before us is, in this influence of the Commonwealth engagement with Sri Lanka, and milestones on the road to the 2013 Colombo in Chogan. Now, just to explain, there's actually two questions there. So I'm going to ask Yolanda, first of all, to talk about milestones on the road to the 2013 Colombo in Chogan. Uh, what's going to happen on the road to Chogan and what kind of benchmark we're looking for on the road to Chogan are. And then um, I will turn it over to Dr. Vinigopal to talk about uh, India's influence in the Commonwealth engagement and how that will help us get there. Um, so, Yolanda, would you mind? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much everybody for inviting me to this important discussion. I think most people are in agreement that the hosting of the Heads of Commonwealth Government meeting in Colombo next year is a potential source of serious embarrassment for the Commonwealth. Given the scale and gravity of what happened in the war, given ongoing reports of torture, arbitrary detention, disappearances and attacks now on the judiciary. When Commonwealth countries announced at Chogham 2011 in Australia that Sri Lanka would host Chogham 2013, they agreed to actively promote and uphold the fundamental values and principles of the Commonwealth, including human rights and the rule of law. And interestingly, if you read the communique that Chogham 2011 issued, they specifically mentioned the importance of sharing best practice and a review of the universal periodic review process of the country concerned. Now, I was at the universal periodic review in Geneva on the 1st of November when Sri Lanka as a country state was reviewed. And I'm very sorry to report that there has been very little progress on human rights in the country since its previous review in 2008. We do have a report on that which is available online which goes into some detail of some of the key areas of concern. This obviously includes accountability which has already been discussed, but it also looks at custodial torture, impunity for enforced disappearances and the failure of independent institutions. <coughs> At the time of Sri Lanka's UPR in 2008, it could be argued that Sri Lanka had more of an argument about developing this argument with member states that you must give us more time and space to deliver on human rights reform because at that time they were facing very serious armed conflict. Um, but what's very depressing is that four years on from the end of the war, when we have a whole series of extremely important and robust reports documenting the scale of gravity of what happened in Sri Lanka, so we have the UN panel of experts report, which has gone into a level of detail about allegations of war crimes and violations of international humanitarian law. We've also had the Committee Against Torture go through its review process on Sri Lanka and, and mention the systematic and widespread nature of custodial torture. We've seen ongoing attacks on journalists. Amnesty has a case, for example, about the enforced disappearance of Pragi Technologoda, who's a similar journalist who um, disappeared after the end of the war. And unfortunately, the Human Rights Council itself has been forced to issue a statement condemning attacks and reprisals against human rights defenders who have attended the Human Rights Council to do advocacy on behalf of domestic human rights. So that's, that is how bad the situation is. Amnesty's own particular research has recently focused on unlawful detention. 
So in March this year, we published a report called Locked Away, which highlights um, a widespread pattern of unlawful detention and draws particular attention to the problematic nature of the ongoing use of repressive security legislation in the country. So Amnesty, exam Amnesty for example, is asking the Sri Lankan government to review or repeal the Prevention of Terrorism Act because this allows for the detention of um, someone for up to 18 months purely on the issue of detention order by request of the Ministry of Defence. And because it allows for admissions of confessions in a court, it is effectively a licence to torture suspects. Now, people have asked, and it's been really interesting in the lunch break, hearing a range of questions and interesting debates about why is it that people are looking at the international community for solutions on Sri Lanka? Shouldn't it be left to Sri Lankans themselves? And I think these are incredibly important questions. Um, what's interesting about Sri Lanka is that it did set up a domestic commission at the end of the war to deal with the question of accountability. Now this commission was called the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission. Many brave people came before that, that commission, including hundreds of relatives of the disappeared, to testify. During that commission, they named perpetrators. They gave locations of army camps where violations have happened. And many of their testimonies captured in a report that Amnesty has published called Waiting to <coughs> Now, the problem is that that domestic commission issued interim recommendations back in 2007 10. These included important recommendations to review detention practices and most importantly, I think, for many victims' families who are still waiting to find out about their loved ones, it specifically highlighted the urgency of the government to tackle the issue of enforced disappearances. Now, Sri Lanka has gone through decades of conflict. It has the highest unresolved number of disappearances at the World Bank on Enforced Disappearances. Now, it is true that many of those enforced disappearances do refer back to cases in the 80s, but the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission itself has now documented hundreds and hundreds of unaccounted for disappearances. There's been no progress on implementation of some of the key recommendations for that. Mm -hmm. And to give you one concrete example, at the UPR review in Geneva, again, the government came with fantastic rhetoric. It claims that it was engaging constructively. It said that it is implementing the lessons learned and reconciliation recommendations. And they have the hubris, frankly, to claim that they have set up a, a, a sort of readily accessible um, list of all detainees so that victims' families can track their loved ones. <coughs> Last week, I received frantic calls from relatives you know, in Sri Lanka who can't access this database. It simply doesn't act, exist in a form that is accessible to victims' families. So I think what you have in Sri Lanka is a context where there are no credible domestic mechanisms to tackle accountability. And what Amnesty is concerned about is a history of impunity in the country. Our focus is not just on the terrible war crimes or allegations at the end of the war. Our interest is in looking at how can Sri Lanka's criminal justice system actually deliver justice to ordinary civilians. We get a lot of complaints, for example, about people who are tracking detainees, that one of the problems they face is a shortcut approach to justice in the country. So the government is tactically using the Prevention of Terrorism Act, for example, to target and intimidate suspects and then hold them, which is a shortcut approach instead of using the ordinary criminal justice system. So I think what we're here though today to do is to look at what can be done in the country to ensure that the hosting of children in October 2013 isn't an incredible embarrassment. And what I would suggest, and it's, it's an idea that has developed a range of um, civil society organisations, including Sri Lankan organisations inside the country, <coughs> is that you know, the Commonwealth Member States should consider a range of specific, actionable recommendations 
that could, benchmarks if you like, that could be put in place before this meeting is held. So, to give you a flavour of Amnesty's priorities and benchmarks, I mean, there's a long laundry list of what people might like to see implemented. But from Amnesty International's perspective, what we see as priorities are firstly a visit by the working group on enforced disappearances to the country. This is something that victims' families have been requesting for years, and in fact, domestic commissions have recommended to the government that it actually implement that. So I see that as a priority issue. Secondly, we don't just want talk about accountability from the government. You know, we are talking about a situation in Sri Lanka where tens of thousands of civilians were killed, hospitals were targeted, where there were restrictions on food, water and shelter. I think anyone who has seen Sri Lanka's killing fields will know that we are talking about a, a I mean, it's very, in fact, I can't, I don't have the words to describe those final months of carnage. So what Amnesty International wants to see is actual prosecution of members of the Sri Lankan government forces, as well as the Liberation Tigers of Tamilan, who did commit abuses in the course of the conflict, and we want to see independent <coughs> investigations. The government came to the UPR process on the 1st of November and claimed that it is having investigations, and yet, when questioned on that, Mahinda Samarasinghe, the envoy for the government, said, yes, we've now convened 30 army courts to reflect on these allegations. An army court, when the perpetrators are members of the security forces, is not an adequate international independent investigation. Thirdly, detention issues. Again, an area flagged by the government's own domestic commission. We want to see the unconditional release of all individuals who have been arrested under anti-terrorism laws unless they're charged with recognisable criminal offences and remanded by an independent, regularly constituted court. We also want Commonwealth Member States to push for the repeal or review of the Prevention of Terrorism Act to bring it in line with international standards. And then finally, if the government of Sri Lanka is genuine in its good faith to engage you know, with UN special procedures and to demonstrate that it does want to live you know, in the spirit of international law, why don't they ratify the optional protocol to the UN Convention Against Torture and Cruel Treatment? It's very interesting <coughs> that at the UPR review, we realise, a refreshing thing that the human rights community realises that a number of member states are no longer fooled by the Sri Lankan government's rhetoric. So when we, I sat in the interactive dialogue during the review and listened to the different member states raising questions, there were a large number of questions raised on accountability issues, which was very refreshing compared to the position that we were in in the Human Rights Council in 2009. And we had states like Uruguay, and Botswana raising questions around the importance of um, international humanitarian law issues. So we had an interesting new movement where we're not just talking about, say, for example, the We Are the Bloc or the European Bloc of the Council who's raising questions around accountability. There are a large number of Latin American countries who raise questions around disappearances. And to give you an indicator of the lack of good faith of the government, they rejected 20 of 22 recommendations to tackle the question of disappearances. So I think with that track record, unless Commonwealth member states do something very concrete in terms of the kind of benchmarks I've discussed and make some progress on that, I think that the Commonwealth's claims to be a values-driven organisation and the promises that they made in the 2011 communique will ring very hollow to people on the ground in Colombia. Thank you very much. Uh